with uh, in my own investigations with others uh, related to First Nations, to folks from Iran and folks from Nigeria. And those are sort of my big three. And I think um, while there are operational alerts that might call those places out um, or communities out, it's also really important to understand communities as best as we can. And so a uh, really good example is the Hawala in Canada is very different than the Hawala in other areas of the world. And, and just because somebody is making use of a Hawala does not mean they're a bad guy. Um, it's a really easy thing to jump to conclusions about the way someone is doing things because you might not do it yourself. Um, but without any sort of cultural understanding and willingness to understand, it, it becomes a, well, we pretty much kick out everybody from a bank except for you. Um, I think it's sort of on our leadership though to start identifying okay, if we're always filing or exiting clients from this place or from this cultural background, why is that? And it's on the institutions at large to speak to the regulators to say, how do you actually want us to treat these trends? Are these trends, do you even care? Or as the last person said, is this really a defensive reaction? I do think there's a really, you know, the, the human element to this is, is huge, but there's really a cascade effect that everyone should be aware of, right? That there are systems that get into place that are triggering these alerts. And it can be as simple as risk rating a geography, right? Which everyone does. And there's reasons for that. But um, that means that possibly many of your alerts that you're seeing and you're running across are from those countries. And guess what? Many of your investigations then become about those countries. And then guess what? Many of your findings are then about those countries, right? So it's this it's this sort of downward spiral. And we see that with systems as they're being implemented. We see that with algorithms. We see that whether they are um, coded algorithms or AI, uh, whether it's anomaly detection, seeing something new and different um, by itself is a flag often, but if it's being trained with one set of data, I, I've seen examples where banks have, for example, said, okay, we're opening up credit card applications and going hard marketing after this ethnic group for whatever reason, great, great, you know, there's an unmet need. They get all these applications in, they all look like a bunch of anomalies <laughs> to them and they all get discarded, right? So, uh, and, and so, you know, it backfires and it's because they, they aren't used to dealing in these terms. So uh, my point being the human side is often an important element as a safeguard and firewall, but you have to realize that there are cascade effects that, and you have to be very careful careful with your systems that you're using and they can they can trigger these these sort of spirals towards towards having proclivity to treating one group differently and it can be very subtle but it's a real a real feedback loop and we saw that for example with Amazon had a great case in hiring right for example just in HR where they started interviewing males for programming roles and the algorithms picked up that they were being the successful hires because they were the only ones being interviewed and that there's a cascade that now suddenly you've learned to only hire males right and and so you have to be very careful not just from a human element but from a system element as well and um, equally that human elephant element might end up becoming desensitized right so so what can we do to try and get around this any ideas or examples in the room we all have good intentions because we're here today, so that's one step. I like I like uh, Bob's idea, like you know, having a diverse background investigator in a team adds that knowledge. Like you know, you understand how different countries, different like you know ethnic group operate. Uh, as he said, I like you know I fully support that. You nobody should make a decision on an investigation completely based on ethnic race or gender background instead you look into the activity yes you can consider like you know that as a factor but you can't solely make a decision on that so what others in the room might not know i'll try and such shed some light here but um asutosha and i as well as sarita who is in the room today um, worked on a project um, that was a total of over 100 investigators um, 
and uh, the people that we hired on the team uh, were from many different backgrounds. Um, it definitely made our potlucks awesome because we got to learn about so many different cultures every Friday. But um, but aside from that, it um, it's not always possible in let's say a large uh, full time corporate structure to be able. Um, to get that breadth in your hiring, but certainly for this project, we were able to get different backgrounds and people to advise us on different patterns that they saw. And that's, I think that's key that as you go on, um, whether or not you've been investigating for 10 months or 10 years, to be able to get insight of what are those trends that are going on elsewhere? How are people using uh, those funds? Um, people are trading using funds using cell phone minutes in other countries. They're not doing that so much in Canada. It's interesting to learn how that happens and to see how those products might be used in a totally different way and to learn from that. I actually think just uh, someone said this already, but just the uh, measuring is key here too, right? So not, not just the systems that you have in place and measuring how they're doing, but but retroactively, what, how, how much is leading to what RFIs, how much is leading to uh, SARS or STRs and, and um, keep not keeping that data blind, right? So I've seen institutions saying, okay, well, we're blinding that data to ethnicity. Well, no, the whole point is, yeah. You, you have to measure these things and, and you have to have that feedback loop. Yeah, I think as well in Canada, we seem to be very hesitant with this privacy aspect, but if we use it in the right way, then I think yeah, I, you're absolutely right. You don't want to be blind to the data that you have there. So, um, so I'll open it up back up in a second, but the one thing we always do, aside from popcorn, which if you need a refill, there's some right here, but we normally do a corny picture for social media. So I'll grab, I'll do a screen grab. So I'll give you a few seconds to do your makeup. So we're gonna do it in, uh, hold on, three, two, one. All right, we got that. Um, I thought, yeah, go for it, Lisa. Um, hi guys. Uh, the one thing I'd also add is it's also the front line. Like I work in a bank that, you know, sometimes I see wording come in through UTRs that come in from the front line, which is clearly has an underlying tone or like some sort of, it's clear that there's some assessment being made on the front line. And so we've kind of gone in and, you know, made very clear parameters around what we'd expect that unusual uh, transaction to be about. Um, you know, I'm not asking the frontline to make the assessment or provide color commentary in their assessment, um, which becomes hard to, you know, if something comes in and my team investigates and decides we're not going to report, if you're using certain words or certain suggestions within the tone of the UTR commentary, it's kind of hard when FinTrack comes in to sort of negate that piece. Um, you know, it, we're a, a huge mortgage lender in the alt space, and that means that, you know, when it's hard to get a house, we notice certain things in our applications. And so we want to make sure that people aren't coloring what their judgment might be on certain areas of the city or certain parts of Canada or that sort of thing. Yeah, and at your business, uh, being an alt lender, you're already trying to deal with that, uh, moving beyond the, the conventional, right? Absolutely. Uh, we can take away from this that uh, diversity, whether it's in the people we work with um, or in the way we approach an investigation is really important. Uh, this is the last pub for the season, so I'm going to be lazy pub-wise for the summer, unless real ones open miraculously, and then I will invite you all. <laughs> um, and uh, hopefully we'll be back in the fall. I'll be back on uh, probably some YouTube. I think I need to do a session on scams on the, the YouTube channel, so um, we'll be out there doing that. Um, I wish you all the best summer, and if you want to reach out, I, I do want to say that having done all these pubs, um, as much as I say I'll resume them in person, I'm happy you know to meet after work. I've met so many people from across the country and around the world on these that I'd have a tough time. Um, I see all the thumbs up, thanks. Um, a tough time uh, moving away from this, so I do hope to resume. And um, I thank you all, and we will have a great, fantastic summer, and we will see you in the fall. Take care now.